No more slogging through the drifts. No more cold, cold winds whipping through layers of outer garments. No more icy sidewalks and streets of peril. Instead, we eagerly anticipate longer days, gardening, softball, and the first official spring edition of Artifacts. Next. Hello, I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. And this is Artifacts. We've got a really big shoe lined up, starting with our guests from the Dayton Hudson Foundation. Followed by a look at the Holocaust exhibit at the Minnesota Museum of American Art. After that, I'll be talking with June Wilson, who is the community art organizer for the Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association. And we'll wrap it all up with a preview of the 10th anniversary ITVA Twin Cities Video Festival. Well, we've said it before, but we'll say it again. This is the first official spring edition of Artifacts. And in honor of spring, we're bringing you something from the Walker Art Center's spring collection of stylish works. The clip you're about to see is from Funny Faces, which will be screened as a part of the Walker's Fashioned on Film series in April. The movie explores the world of fashion from a distinctly, distinctly Hollywood perspective. And for more information on this film series, call The Walker at 375-7622. Enjoy. Letty, take an editorial. To the women of America. No, take it to the women everywhere. Banish the black, burn the blue, and bury the beige. From now on, girls... Think pink, think pink when you shop for summer clothes. Think pink, think pink if you want that kelp to show. Red is dead, blue is through, green's obscene, brown's taboo, and there is not the slightest excuse for plum abuse or chartreuse. Think pink, forget that Dior says black and rust. Think pink, who cares if the new look has no bust? Now, I wouldn't presume to tell a woman what a woman ought to think, but tell her if she's got to think. Think pink. Pink for pink, pink for shoes. Well, that was a fun clip, and Janet will have more to talk about that uh, later on in the show. Well, I'm very pleased to have as my next guests two people who are with uh, the Dayton Hudson Foundation. Uh, as many of our viewers will know, the Dayton Hudson Foundation is a central player in the cultural life of the Twin Cities area. And uh, just last month, some news was made because they've uh, appointed a new director, Chris Park, and I want to thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having us. And Ben Cameron, you are the program officer. That's correct. Thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure. And we want to chat with both of you about okay. your individual roles and maybe some of the changes that are going on at the foundation. But for those people that are watching the show that are not familiar with what a foundation is in general, or maybe just aren't familiar with what Dayton Hudson does through its foundation, maybe you could just set the table a little bit and talk about what is the Dayton Hudson Foundation and what's its role here in our community? Okay, I'll begin and let Ben add uh, as we go along. The Dayton Hudson Foundation is a, the corporate foundation for the Dayton Hudson's corporation, which includes Target, Dayton's, Hudson's, Mervyn's, and Marshall Fields. So we are the arm of giving that is the corporate piece of that. We, um, we basically supplement the giving done by the, the um, operating companies as well. So our role in this community is to be a, a funder, and we've chosen to do a lot of funding in the arts. That's right, a significant amount. Mm -hmm. That's right. And as program officer, you have a, a vantage point. How long have you been with the uh, foundation? I've been with the foundation for a little over two years. Okay, so you've seen a couple cycles come and go here. A few, yes. That's and great. I was in philanthropy before and used to follow Minneapolis from a distance. 
Oh, what? Where were you in that at that distance? The National Endowment for the Arts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you kind of out of the frying pan into the hinterland yeah. here. <laughs> exactly. It's a much cooler place than it was in Washington. That's great. But well, welcome. It's thank good. you. It's good to be here. Sure. Well, the Dayton Hudson Foundation, as I understand it historically, was one of the leaders in what we describe as the five percent club, and I think there's also a two percent club. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and what that's meant for local culture? Sure. Um, the Daytons early on really were the founders of that whole idea of 5%, and they, uh, as early as 1946, began giving 5% of their pre-tax profits back to the communities, and they've done that every year since 1946, so we think that's something to be very proud of. And they really took a leadership role and, and were out and about and, and, and really encouraging other companies to do that as well. Some clearly were able to do 2%, some less than that, some more. Dayton's, Day, Dayton Hudson really does remain on the cutting edge of retailers doing 5%, so mm -hmm. they've, uh, they've continued since 40, 1946 to, to press that and hope that others would do as well. And they've been able to maintain that through up and downs in the Absolutely. business cycle. Absolutely. They have. They have. I was going to say, to put a more <laughs> tangible face on it, perhaps, that, that meant really last year that we give wherever we have marketplaces or where, wherever we have stores, but last year the corporation as a whole gave away about 21 to $22 million, mm -hmm. of which roughly a third of that stayed here in the Twin Cities for purposes of giving here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Right. Very impressive. And that's not only in the arts. I know that Correct. social right. services and other mm -hmm. areas as well. Yeah, we do about 45% of our funding in the arts, however. That's right. Yeah. Chris, what does the director of a foundation do? What, what's on your desk? What comes over the phone lines uh, Monday through Friday? And I'll bet it's longer than five days a week, too. Um, well, I don't know yet about the five days a week. I haven't, <laughs> haven't seen five days a week yet, but I imagine I will at some point. Yeah. Um, really, my role is, as, um, is to provide leadership, uh, to work with the staff. To, I do a lot of grant review um, in the miscellaneous category. Ben is with us today because his focus is on the arts. That's really his, um, his strength and his responsibility. We have another program officer, Polly Muntz, who does our social um, action-focused giving. Mm -hmm. Um, so my, my job is to connect with people, kind of keep track of what's going on in the community, r really make those connections and support the staff that's also doing our key grant making. So and, and you came to Dayton Hudson by way of another one of its divisions. Correct. I was, I was managing Target's Giving Program, which was um, a, a fairly large program, but it was national. And it was a lot of giving in many communities in smaller amounts. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to the job was the chance to really get back in building my roots here as a, as a Minnesotan. So. Right. And I understand, just to finish one thought, you have a, an education background mm -hmm. earlier in your career. Mm -hmm. I taught for a few years, discovered pretty quickly that was not the right thing for me. Um, got into community organizing, so mm -hmm. my heart is in the community, and so it's really nice to be back That's doing right. that. That's uh, right. St. Paul. Mm -hmm. You worked over there in the yes. city hall staff. That's mm -hmm. great. Good. Well, mm -hmm. nice background to bring to uh, philanthropy. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed, I, I loved my job at Target. It was great fun. It was fun to be part of a national program that was growing all the time. I also did a lot of work with their volunteer program. Uh, but I was, I was really ready to take on the challenge of the foundation and get really connected here. So okay. I'll, I've been looking forward to it, and it's been lots of fun so far. Sure. Now, Ben, you yes. made the move from uh, everything that Washington, D.C. implies and the National Endowment yes. for the Arts to the Twin Cities. What brought you here? Obviously, a job with the Aiden Hudson Foundation, but a absolutely. what drew uh, your attention? I, I was enticed by a couple of things. Minneapolis has clearly been known, as long as I've been in the professional arts community, as being a real hub and a center for professional arts. Uh, I've been with the theater program in uh, Washington, D.C., and came in and out of Minneapolis, Minneapolis a lot to see professional theater. Very engaged by what I saw, very engaged by the community, very uh, responsive to other things I perceived about the community. Part of what attracted me to this job was, frankly, uh, when I entered government philanthropy, I entered under someone who convinced me no one should stay at the NEA more than four years. It was bad for the field as well as bad for the agency, so my tenure was drawing to its natural cycle. And this job offered me an opportunity to really expand because here I not only do theater, I do orchestras and dance companies and literary presses and film groups and choruses and you name it. If it's mm -hmm. an arts organization, it falls under my purview. So it sounds like they were talking about term limits there. <laughs> oh, yeah, we were ahead of the curve that way. I think so. Yes. In fact, I saw a news story the other day that um, uh, Clinton is suggesting that the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, um, getting to peer review for some of its product reviews. I think it was, not that very similar to the NEA? Absolutely. Peer review, so. It's the basis of all their decision making. That's right. Okay. 
What is it you do as program officer? Are you the person that people call and, and make initial contact with? Uh, my day is really divided into two parts, frankly. Uh, my eight to five sort of day is spent a lot on the telephone talking to local arts groups. If a group wants to talk to us about funding, they do come to me. Uh, we have a conversation based on some submitted materials as well as my perception of the quality of the work and how well they fit our particular focus areas. In, in addition to that part of the day, which is largely conversational, largely research, doing reading about other national arts trends, I'm out four or five nights a week at performances or poetry readings or art exhibits, not only to keep a handle on the progress our grantees are making in their own work, but to sort of see what else is out there that we might not know about or we might be interested in having a funding relationship with and to really keep on top of what's going on in the arts community here in the Twin Cities. Well, that raises a, a topic that I'd like to explore with both of you a little bit and, and that what I call issues and trends or, or, or movements and changes yeah. in certainly in our cultural sector. Um, we're feeling some negative trends yeah. right now, at least uh, the perception is uh, starting at the national level and maybe cycling through at local levels. Uh, public support may be getting changed or, or, or dried up. Mm -hmm. um, I think even foundations in the philanthropic community are feeling kind of a squeeze and over the last five, six years, yeah. I know locally, a little bit of a redefinition of priorities. Let me ask two questions. First, how does a foundation do in the broadest sense, in the phil uh, philosophical sense, what you're describing you do on a daily basis? How do you decide, Chris, what the foundation might want to be involved in five years down the road? Mm -hmm. I think that the, a lot of that comes out of, um, of the connections we have in community, kind of things that Ben's talking about where he is out there, he is experiencing what's going on, he's listening, he's meeting with people, etc. We do that certainly on the social service side as well. Um, we try and really stay connected um, so that we can see what's coming down the pike. Now we've been a, a long time funder of the arts. We have not uh, really strayed from that at all in our history. Our social action area, we have, we have done more social action funding of late than we have in the past, although we've always had a strong commitment there. Uh, and the focus has changed over the years. Uh, we have for quite a long time now been very engaged in funding the whole arena of, um, of job readiness, of life readiness, self-sufficiency, the kinds of programs that get uh, people who either are having a hard time functioning in society or at risk of having a hard time functioning, um, really getting them to be self-supporting members of society and not beyond public assistance. So that's been mm -hmm. our main focus area. But we are constantly looking for, you know, what is the next thing that we might want to do. On the other hand, I do want to suggest that we are not the kind of funder that shifts with the wind. Oh, well, gee, right now, um, the, the hot issue is domestic violence. This year we're going to fund domestic violence. We really have been uh, a strong supporter of organizations over time, and we never, never pull the rug out is sort of the terminology we use at the foundation. We never do that. If we decided we wanted to move another direction, either within our arts focus or within our social action focus, we would do that uh, systematically and thoughtfully over time. Right. I think that'd be refreshing at the at the grassroots level, at the front line. We want our folks to recognize that we consider this a partnership, and it is not a gift from us to them. It is a partnership whereby they're doing work for us in the community that we can't do ourselves, that we really value, and consequently, we want to be there for them and help them plan ahead. It's one of the reasons why we've stayed such a strong funder with major arts organizations, so they know we're there for them. They can count on it. They can build their Continuity. programs based on that. Yeah. Well, that leaves to my second question. Maybe, sure. Ben, you can address this. Um, we've got a couple minutes left and not enough time to really answer this in depth. I read something that you wrote for the Southern Theater magazine. Oh, God. I knew they'd come back to haunt me. Okay. No, no. Yep. I, I very much appreciated <laughs> it. And you were talking okay. about... No, no. I, okay. I very much appreciate it. I found it refreshing. Oh, um, sort of a lack of vision, a lack of articulating core values in the mm -hmm. arts community, mm -hmm. and that we've really ceded the, uh, the argument sort of to the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and my question really revolves around leadership and I how and is there a role uh, in the job that you do to, to spur some of that kind of thinking in certainly the local community, but by extension the broader cultural community? I, I think, oh boy, that's a loaded question. Yeah, yeah I know, it's, it's a hard one. I mean, I, um, I think basically the point that I was trying to get to, which I think you've summarized accurately, is that part of the difficulty the arts community has as a community is we've often thought fr in a fragmented basis by discipline by discipline. So what the orchestras may perceive to be the most important values it may be different than what dance perceives and what uh, uh, theater perceives may be different and so when the arts community is called on to articulate a common viewpoint it's very hard to transcend those discipline barriers and in fact the endowment structure may actually have promoted that kind of segmented thinking 
Uh, now I think what we're seeing in terms of arts groups is more and more interdisciplinary work, uh, less freestanding institutions appearing in more uh, uh, multidisciplinary centers, more uh, artwork integrated into other kinds of social work. So I think that dialogue is starting by the very nature of the way arts institutions are appearing and being sustained. Beyond that, I, I think we are beginning to talk about uh, in, a, in a stronger way than maybe we have in the past about in addition to making grants, which is clearly one thing a foundation does, is there an appropriate other role that we can or should play in the future? And what would that be and what might that look like? And uh, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of what your ideas on that are or if we're just if we're in well, the midst of that or unfortunately we're, we're really running out of time I want to tune in tomorrow tune in tomorrow <laughs> well, let's have you back and, and maybe do an update on this sort of thing because okay. um, I find it uh, refreshing to, to have some thoughtful uh, discussion about the future of the role for the arts okay. we'd be happy and to funders. Ben you. thanks for being on the show thank you okay Chris thank you welcome to the job thanks okay now still to come on artifacts uh, the latest news from a Powderhorn Park community organizer and uh, then we'll be taking a look at a local film video organization that's playing with a full decade. You're not going to figure any of this out until uh, later in the show, trust me. So we'll be back just after this. Well, those are some images from uh, an interesting and I think rather strong show over at the Minnesota Museum of American Art. And I have two people here well qualified to talk with us about that show and maybe a few other things that they're doing in their lives and what's going on over at the museum. Joyce Lyon is an artist, mm -hmm. uh, lives in Minneapolis and is represented in the show. Yes. Okay, indeed. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being on here. And Roger Hegeman, you are the marketing and communications person. That's right. Is that right? Yes. And also, just for background information, a former Minneapolis Arts Commissioner, so a little bit of a tie there. And uh, an artifacts note here, you happen to be our 250th and 251st guests on this show. So, so we get the tickets to uh, Disney World. That's that right. That's right. You guys can go have fun at Disney World. <laughs> or at the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Well, that would be great. How's that for a segue? Mm -hmm. Roger, let me ask you, for those folks who maybe not familiar with the beautiful galleries you've got there and the history of the Minnesota Museum of American Art, what is the museum? What's its general mission? Mm -hmm. Well, the Minnesota Museum is about 70 years old. It is St. Paul's, and I make that distinction, only visual arts museum. Um, we are uh, focused really on, on regional art, and uh, this exhibition, while Joyce may be our, our only regional contributor at this moment, is really the direction the museum is going. And we're located in Landmark Center, which is right next to the Ordway Music Theater, and is part of the uh, the cultural corridor, as it's called, in downtown St. Paul, and really offers a, a lot of opportunity for visitors. That's right, and a lot of other museums down there, although not necessarily in the visual arts. Correct. The Science Museum is only a few blocks away, and opening in September will be the new Children's Museum. Right. Big news. Yep. That's right. exciting. And Joyce, you are represented in the show. We're going to talk about the show a little bit, but yeah. uh, just to begin that uh, discussion, what is it you do? What's your medium? What do you work in? Uh, generally, I'm someone who makes drawings, and in this exhibit, they are large-scale drawings with uh, juxtapositions of text. Uh, the topic, the, the Holocaust, seemed, seemed to require that there be words, words added to the, to the images. The, one of the thrusts of this exhibit is a number of 22 artists trying to get at something which is really not addressable. Yeah. And so um, here I've added text as, a, as a, another language to help get towards that. Mm -hmm. So a telling in yet another yes. discipline, as it were. a partial telling in a number of ways. Um, maybe a simple question, but I'm curious, why this exhibition? What drove putting this particular show together? Well, you know, Phil, we're on the 50th anniversary of the end of the war in Europe and in, in Asia as well, and, and I think there is a consciousness about uh, that fact. But in addition, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the, we, the show ha includes survivors of the camps and the experience of the Holocaust and the children of survivors and then other artists who have been moved by that experience. In the case of the survivors themselves, we're at a point where it's an older generation and they, I think, are realizing their mortality. Mm -hmm. And many of them really only have begun to, to 
work with this issue of their history within the last five to ten years. And so this is really a very current body of work that's, that yeah. has come available to us. Yeah. Joyce, how did they connect with you? Uh, this w there were three curators for this exhibit, and one of them was a former student of mine. One was um, a scholar who I had met. Uh, one was a curator who I had invited to my studio. I'm not sure exactly which of those three threads um, was the crucial one. but. Mm -hmm. uh, and your personal connection to this topic? I mean, this is a very personal, yes. as well as, in some ways, a universal Yes. Um, I am the second generation. My father was born in Poland. He came to the United States in 1937, but he lost parents, brother, and pretty much the whole community. Um, in Zeszów, in south of Poland, was sent to camp at Belzec. And I think, I think, um, uh, we were talking about the, the fact that the survivors have reached a point of, uh, of um, older age and we need, to talk to, we need to get their work before they go. I think there's also, for the second generation, as we hit middle age, there seems to be a, a, a kind of pre preparation or curiosity to know more. As I was growing up, th this wasn't talked about in my household. There was this kind of dark silence around it. At a certain point, I felt I needed to know more to understand what it was that that I had inherited from this. Mm -hmm. And so that's and what led me. I mean, this is not something, even if it's not talked about, yeah. it's daily, essentially. There's a very strong image that I found in a survive, uh, second generation literature, a description of growing up with, in the living room, as if there were a large black box that filled all the empty spaces with hard, sharp edges that no one acknowledged. Mm. In my house, it was a smaller box, but it was there. It was there. Yeah. Well, in a few moments, we're going to take a look at some images of your work. But Roger, you also brought some more images uh, beyond the ones we saw coming into this discussion. Why don't you walk us through what you brought? Well, the first image is one that is, uh, is done by one of the uh, survivors herself. Her name is Judith Goldstein. And as you can see uh, on the screen, there is uh, the image of, of bodies in a cart. Uh, being drawn by, in fact, you see the individual has a yellow star, so that represents that he or is a Jew himself. And overhanging that, those figures, is this kind of on, uh, ominous looking claw hand with the uh, swastika on it. Judith had an incredible survival experience. She survived the, the Vilna ghetto in Poland and then uh, went through uh, the Schuthof concentration camp and survived. She, in fact, came to our opening. She's about five feet tall and a woman of incredible energy and vitality. And if you were to meet her, you just, you know, mm. it would be hard to believe that this is the record that she saw of her experience there. Oh. The uh, next uh, image is similarly one by a survivor. Her name is Nettie Vanderpoel. And Nettie was a classmate of Anne Frank. And uh, she and her family were incarcerated in the Terezin concentration camp. And she and her family managed to escape in a very unique and really totally accidental fashion, as often happened. Uh, the Nazis offered a prisoner of war exchange for German prisoners who were held in Switzerland and, and uh, Jewish uh, concentration camp uh, prisoners. And her father said, we'll take it. All the rest of the people in the camp said, no, 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 it's a trick. But he said, no, we'll go. And he took the risk, and the family did escape in the only uh, event of that time. And she uh, herself has said that only in the last decade has she really begun to be able to consider her, that history. And the work that you see is very interesting because it's needlepoint, which is an extremely mm -hmm. detailed and, and very uh, meditative kind of thing. And what you see is a, uh, the yellow star that the Jews had to wear, um, a piece of barbed wire, and uh, the, her number that was part of the transport when she mm -hmm. was left Holland. Okay. And it's, uh, it's you know, very spare and very simple and unlike a lot of work that one might mm -hmm. think about the Holocaust is uh, potent perhaps because it doesn't right. have a lot of... Uh, well, you've got a couple more images and we've just got a minute or so left. What else do you have? And then I do want to talk about Joyce's. Well, the final image is uh, also, she's uh, uh, by an artist named Debbie Teicholz, who is herself the children of survivors. And this looks like a pile of wood, which in fact it is. But as she said, to have that experience, everything can take on the image of the Holocaust. So it can become a pile of bones. And I think Joyce, in some way, has, has looked at you know, that kind of experience herself. Well, thank you. Uh, let's talk about what you, your images that you've got. 
My images are landscape Im images. The first one that you're seeing is, all of these are part of a series called Conversations with Jeshuf. And some of the images are familiar, local. Uh, this is the bird sanctuary at Lake Harriet. Um, chosen, part of, part of my um, discovery here is that I could learn a lot and then there was a point at which I couldn't know. And so it, it's kind of a, a med mediation and meditation back and forth, trying to discover how much could be understand and where I had to let it go. Mm -hmm. This first image um, is accompanied, uh, I, I did an artist book of these images and text as well, by a poem by Prima Levi, a piece of a poem called Pliny. Don't hold me back, friends, let me set out. I won't go far, just to the other shore. I want to observe at close hand that dark cloud shaped like a pine tree rising above Vesuvius and find the source of this strange light. Mm. Um, one of the ways we can know things is through metaphor. One of the things is by comparing what, how it's different from things that we know. Um, I felt an incredible responsibility in this work to find a way that, that was authentic, where I wasn't pretending to know something that I, as an American, couldn't know, and yet wanted to memorialize the fact that there's an ongoing repercussion. What my father carries with him, I grew up with, I am aware of. Um, traumas like this continue to live even past. Mm -hmm. The second image is chimneys at Birkenau, um, an image that I saw on a trip to Poland. Um, accompanied by a, a, a text by Francine Pro Prose. Whenever I write a sentence of this, I feel the dead enter the room. I feel them crowding behind me to peer over my shoulder, to read what I have written, to grumble and complain. The theme of the dead's conversation is that I know nothing about it. There is no argument about this, certainly not from me. I think that there, what I have discovered is that the truth is knowable, the facts slip, uh, the search is what's important. In the structure of this book, there are a lot of pages that look like have one image and then you open and something else is revealed underneath. It seems appropriate to the show as well. That's something people could see at the uh, yes. exhibit? Yes, the, ex the, sh the book is there as well. And Roger, we've got to run, but this exhibit is up through? Through May 14th. At the Landmark at Center. Landmark Center. Downtown St. Paul. And call 292-4336 for the hours. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sharing the exhibition well, and you. your particular mm -hmm. work. Very thank much you. appreciate it. Thanks. Roger, thank you. Nice to meet you and have you on the show. Thank you. Well, next up, June Wilson, who's organizing arts in the Powderhorn Park community. But first, uh, our own City Cable 34 crew recently caught some video of the Hammering Man down at the IDS Center in downtown Minneapolis. If you haven't seen this in person, you really should get down there. We'll be right back. Well, that's a nice look at the hammering man down at the IDS Crystal Court. Now, my next guest is someone I'm very excited actually to meet because uh, we've done a series of discussions about Minneapolis neighborhoods that are using the arts as a development tool, but I'm actually going to be talking with, I believe, the first person who's been hired specifically as a community art organizer, and her name is June Wilson. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, I'm glad you, you could be here. Me. And June Wilson, you are doing this with the Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association. That's right. And for those folks who have no idea where Powderhorn Park is, can you tell us where it is? Yes, Powderhorn Park uh, is the boundaries of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's from 38th Street to Lake Street, and then from Cedar to Chicago Avenue. And that would be considered the Powderhorn Park neighborhood. Right. Now there's the Powderhorn Planning District, which is larger and covers several neighborhoods. All oh, right. Yes. Okay. And but then, of course, there's the fairly well-known Powderhorn Park itself, the right. green space with the pond in there. Right, and that's right in the center yeah. of our neighborhood. Yeah, which is a great asset in itself. Correct. Right, and Correct. this is all in South Minneapolis. 
And then the neighborhood organization, mm -hmm. uh, which I assume you work for Correct. directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. um, is involved in, what stage are they in with the um, NRP? Now this is the Neighborhood Revitalization Plan. Right, and we've gone through implementation, and so we're trying to just get our contracts done. And um, we have the arts contract that we're waiting. We had, we've gone back to legal review to get the information back, how we need to revise our contract. But for the most part, things are looking very good for us to really go ahead and start doing a series of arts programming. Though we've already started that. I was hired in August. And we started that through the early access fund that came through okay. to give us a chance to see um, what kind of programming we could do and how that would work out. Now, I think of Powderhorn. In fact, I used to live in the Powderhorn neighborhood, um, a couple different places. Um, is having a lot of art and culture there already. Um, but what you're talking about is bringing this together and a lot of new things. Do you want to just start anywhere and tell us what all you're doing? Yeah, sure. We're um, really trying to bring the arts into the community and integrate it in the community so that we're looking at community building, using arts as a vehicle for community bu building and social change. And so that's a little different from just having a series of events and performances, which we are doing, but a lot of our performances really are focusing on um, various cultural components. We had a Hmong event that brought in um, so the, some of the Hmong community um, to do performances as well as um, there was a, a, what do you call it, um, a marketplace oh. with several different um, Asian um, okay. artists there. With some of the handiwork, some handiwork from yes. the handicrafts that are made. Absolutely. And then we had a Native event mm -hmm. um, in celebration, and it was celebrating the coming of spring, which was right in the middle of January. Um, well, that's a hopeful sign. Right. In the of January. <laughs> and that was very successful, and many of the Native community, as well as just the, the community, came out to experience the Native. Uh, that one must have worked pretty well, because we had a very warm January, as yes. I recall. Yes. <laughs> I think Thank so. You. <laughs> yes. And then we had a Martin Luther King Day event, mm -hmm. which had mm -hmm. about 300, 400 people. We were only expecting about 100 people. Oh. Um, and it, we had African dance and drumming. And uh, it was really very successful. Well, let me interrupt mm -hmm. the train of thought there for a second. What kind of facilities? Where do you have 300, 400 people showing up for this? We had it at the park in the gym. Okay. And we used the stage where the performance occurred. Mm -hmm. And then we had lunch. Um, Gladys's, which is right on the corner there, mm -hmm. she serves chicken and black eyed peas. And we, you know, we had we were expecting 100 people, so but we made the food go to feed 300 people. It was good. really amazing. Well, anyhow, I interrupted you. Yeah. We had other things going on. There's some youth-oriented things. Right. We've had um, a, during our Latin event, which was in September of last year. Um, for that, we had a workshop where we had uh, uh, Hispanic artists come in and do um, some mass with some young people. Um, and then we've also had a workshop happening at the City Inc. Um, it's a video workshop and a writing workshop where students from the City Inc. are learning video technique as well as some writing poetry and, po and prose. So obviously all the disciplines are involved here. I mean, literature, writing, um, dance, music, visual arts, mm -hmm. it's all there. We're really wanting to incorporate um, all the different techniques and stuff. Now I have to look this one up because mm -hmm. I was looking through something that described um, some of the activities you were doing. And in something I read, I, I ran across a word I wasn't quite familiar with. I think it happened last summer, a, a crepuscule. Now, yeah, what the heck is that? Um, it means twilight. Okay. And what we, uh, Douglas Ewart, who's a musician here in town, he got together with a whole bunch of other performance artists and musicians, came to the park, and had an interactive performance. And as people were just walking through the park, they can come and pick up, play some instruments. Performers were going out on the lake um, in canoes and performming and singing and really improvisational, nothing structured. We were just Wonderful. going and moving as, you know, as people came in and out. And this is all at twilight? Twilight? Yes, it was right at twilight. Because I was diving for my dictionary because I saw that <laughs> and I said, now what are they doing in Powder Horn Park? That sounds like fun. It was. It sounds was a lot great. of fun and we hope to continue that every year. Wonderful. And it was right in October when the colors were changing. It was very mm. beautiful. And as you say, you've been, you've personally been at this since last August for the yes. neighborhood. Right. And that reminds me, um, there's some long-standing cultural things that go on there too because right. there's the art fair. Right, the art in, fair. Is that August? That's in August yeah. and then May Day, which happens every, you know, May. That's and right. And the, um, in the Heart of the Beast. Mm -hmm. Does that and then parade um, leads up there, right? Yeah. And Powder Horn Activities Council does the Fourth of July yeah. and uh, the the arts fair. And this year we're going in with uh, Powder Horn Activities Council to do the Fourth of July. Well, to bring it back because last year we um, weren't able to have the Fourth of July, but hopefully we will have it back well, with fireworks. And I'm everything. old enough to remember the Minnesota Orchestra down there and the fireworks, and it was great. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
personal background? Um, you're sitting at home and all of a sudden, what, the phone rings and they say, <laughs> June, we want you. How, how did this happen? Well, I wish it happened like yeah, that. What you know, um, I was working at the Minnesota Dance Alliance and I worked there for five and a half years. Um, I was a program director and we did a huge project called Baboo's Magic. Yes. Um, and we brought in several um, African artists from outside. Chuck Davis came in and trained a lot of the community people. There were about a hundred performers involved. And I was part of coordinating that event and really working with the community, several schools, um, elders. It really went from the youngest person was age seven up to I think 75, wow. um, 80. So uh, it was a huge project that happened the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden and it was a year-long project and after working on that I knew that I really wanted to do work with the community and arts and then mm -hmm. as I was leaving um, the Dance Alliance the job opening came up at Powderhorn and Great. I applied for it and got well, it. Congratulations. Yeah. Do you have a personal background in dance or yes, what? Yes, in dance. Okay. I am a choreographer and dancer okay. myself. And That's great. Um, um, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, sounds wonderful. You've got a lot of things going on there. Mm -hmm. Difficulties, challenges, are, are, are there some people that aren't receptive to what is going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, coming in through the NRP uh, process and trying to have an arts component um, was difficult in itself, just getting the community to feel like it was something valuable. I think a lot of times people have a perception that the arts is something, you know, it's a luxury and not something that can be integrated in the community and they're not able to see the impact that it can have. And so um, writing the plan and trying to get a, a significant amount of money set aside for arts programming was very important. But there are many artists who live in the Powderhorn neighborhood, so they were really pushing for that. And and really wanting to have life be more than just struggling to survive and struggling to put food on the table, but come up with ways that people can have the creative process involved in their life and so they can see that they are interactive in, ha in, in the choices they can make in their life and really help create the best kind of living that they can have. And um, the arts can do that and can help do that and help um, you know, give young people other alternatives as well. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. I, I, I wanted to ask, are people meeting each other or working with each other that wouldn't have otherwise been getting together around some of these Absol events? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, both the Native event, we were all just overwhelmed because the number of Native people who helped put it together and then non-Native people who came to the event itself, it was really a cross-cultural experience that was really community-based and people from the community sharing with each other and sharing culture with each other as well as, you know, the arts with each other and performance and learning about the drum and what the drum means and some of their rituals. Sounds so, great. Yeah. Given your experience, and it sounds by and large way most of it very positive, do, would you have any uh, advice for any neighborhood, whether it's in Minneapolis or anywhere else, about how to work with the arts building community? Yeah, the difficult piece is really um, coming up with, you know, setting something in the NRP plan. And really, there are what, you know, along the process you can feel discouraged and like the arts, the arts won't get through and how can we incorporate that. But there are ways of really doing that, just understanding clearly what the intent of NRP is and how it really um, can address the community through economic development, through crime and safety, through um, some of the social service avenues being understanding that process um, so that you don't get discouraged because it can be very a difficult process in trying to create the contract and get the money through mm -hmm. and and feel like it's important well good sounds like just sticking with it learning paying attention mm -hmm. June it sounds to me like they got the right person the right job well I think so <laughs> oh, <laughs> good for you thanks for being on the show thank sharing you. with us a little bit about Powderhorn yes, that's thank great you. well Coming up, the Twin Cities chapter of the International Television Association is playing with a full decade. And, if you, find, and you will find out why next, just after this first official Spring Artifacts factoid.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Janet Zahn with the Office of Film, Video, and Recording for the City of Minneapolis. With me today are two very good friends of mine, Jean Canton and Diane Field. And you guys have been working diligently <laughs> on a wonderful event, yes, yes. the ITVA 10th Anniversary Twin Cities Video Festival. Tell me about this, Jean. What is this festival all about? Well, the festival, it, um, it's been a way to showcase excellence in video production in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And as you said, this year is the 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a little special because we're going to see the best of the best of this year, but we're also going to look back at the past 10 years and mm -hmm. see what people did back in 1985 and 86 in terms of corporate video. Mm -hmm. And I think that will be real fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a little different look from way back then to now. I understand it's worth the price of admission. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we get into too much of the festival, I do want to take a step back so that people who don't know what ITVA is and what that's all about, we need to tell people a little bit about this organization. It works with corporate film and video producers. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a professional organization, mm -hmm. basically for people who use television as a, a medium for their message. Mm -hmm. Video uh, and film producers, um, corporate people, it's... Um, uh, a lot of in-house producers, but also actually now the majority of them are freelance producers, independent contractors. There's been a change in the industry over the years, the, the change from the in-house to the, to the freelance side of things. Mm -hmm. More freelancers now. Yes, I think the split used to be 80-20, 80% 80 80 probably on staff at a corporation or a company, mm -hmm. and 20% of the people were freelance, and that's just been juxtaposed, and now it's 20% mm -hmm. of people you know, in-house, and then 80% of the community is freelance. Mm -hmm. And I just want to quickly say, if people want to know more about ITVA or if they want to, you know, join or find out more information, they should call the ITVA hotline, and that number is 927-8747. And now we've gotten through that. And now I want to get back to the festival, because okay. it's going to be so much fun. Tell me a little bit of the highlights of the evening. Well, uh, you the, told me some, but yes, I know yeah, that there's, that you know. I think one of the, the things that we're most excited mm -hmm. about is that Don Shelby is going to be hosting it for mm -hmm. us. Um, the other thing is that uh, I've heard this rumor that Princess Di will be attending. I read, I read that, is actually. That right? yes, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And so uh, <laughs> maybe you can uh, address that, Di. <laughs> well, I was so busy trying to get down here today, I did not have time to stop at the bank vault to get my tiara. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to make a point of it before the show. Before the show. Oh, I'm so looking forward to seeing Princess die. die. We also yes. have um, uh, John and Jay, mm -hmm. enter local entertainers who have hosted it uh, mm -hmm. in the past, are, are doing a kind of a retrospect on the best of John and Jay over the years. And Sue Scott, who is a local actress, will be doing a dramatic poetry reading. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea behind the festival is that this is a competition. People from the local community have entered their work mm -hmm. that they did in 1994. And um, tell me about, uh, you know, what kind of work is entered, what sorts of categories are they, how are they judged, that side of the thing. Um, most of the work, as I said, is, is corporate. We do, uh, there's no broadcast. Um, uh, categories are education and training, internal communication, sales and marketing. Um, video wall production documentaries, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So if somebody, somebody is out there, what's something that people might see, the general public might see, that they would recognize as a corporate kind of production? I think there, there are a couple of things. I think most people who work for companies mm -hmm. have seen the kind of video that we're talking about in training and, mm -hmm. and um, things like that. But probably this year, one of the best ex uh, examples of that is the Answer Center out at Best Buy, which is a multimedia kiosk, mm -hmm. and that involved most of the Twin Cities production industry, I uh -huh. think, in the production of that. Mm -hmm. so. And very recognizable to the general public mm -hmm. as Absolutely. they go in all the retail stores. Yeah, so if they went out to the Best Buy in Richfield, they'd see these Answer Centers, and they'd look. I think I read that there were a thousand video clips that is went that right? into the making mm -hmm. of these answer centers. And that's all local people doing the shooting, the directing, the writing, and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And that's what this is all about. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. And so we'll meet the winners and see some of their work? We'll see uh, clips of all the finalists, the mm -hmm. people who were judged to be the best of the best. And then among those finalists, there is an award of merit given and an award of excellence. And we will mm -hmm. uh, meet the producers and directors of those pieces. Mm -hmm. And we have actually a we couple have, of Yes, we have a, 
uh, examples of a couple of finalists mm -hmm. in the internal communications category. Mm -hmm. um, these come from CME Video and Film mm -hmm. Production. Let's and roll them. Yeah. On February 16th, four days before the official opening of the exhibition, a special preview was held. Among the guests were some of America's most respected architects. I think it's very important to have exhibitions on architecture. It's the most important art. It affects everyone's life. And I think anyone who's experienced Frank Lloyd Wright's Johnson Wax building will understand how that changes the way day-to-day -day life is carried out. Just a job with a healthy bird. It's what we do, it's who we are. We love our work. Hand in hand. What a great set of pieces. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the caliber of work for the whole evening mm -hmm. is right up there. I think it's uh, that's one of the really nice things about attending the festival is that you get a chance to see what people are doing around town and. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of networking opportunities. Yes, yes. So we we just kind of got a chance to see a little bit about about what you know, what we're going to see at the festival. But that that's mm -hmm. indicative, I think, of the caliber of work that's done generally in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. Diane, how would you characterize the corporate production community in Minneapolis? Where do you think we fit in in terms of of the um, the quality of work and the level that we're at here in Minneapolis? Well, there's so many major corporations that are based out of this area. And just as an example, I do a lot of work for companies like General Mills, Best Buy, mm -hmm. Super Value, NSP. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is just such a tremendous amount of work here in this community because so many of those corporations are based here. Mm -hmm. And out of that, what's nice is it's generally very stable and consistent work because the companies have a very solid foundation. And those are some of the rewards of working uh, for some of the corporate giants. Mm -hmm. Why would either of you choose to work in this part of the film video industry as opposed to working in feature film or corporate production? Either one. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, quite frankly, uh, as a single parent, I found it sometimes easier for me to work in corporate production as opposed to feature film work. And that is just a logistic thing. Uh, feature films come into town and you have an incredibly aggressive schedule uh, where you're you know, up at 3 in the morning and you're on an ice rink at 4 a.m. <laughs> and you don't know, you're not done shooting till midnight. And as a parent, uh, whether you're single or not, it's a very difficult schedule to maintain uh, with children. Mm -hmm. So I found more continuity for my own life uh, working in corporate production. Mm -hmm. And I do some commercial production as well. Sure, sure. I think maybe uh, it's odd, at least for Diane and I, children play a part in our decision as to why we do what we do. My partner, Lee, told a story about, he used to do lots of uh, uh, commercial work, and he told a story about how he was buried in chicken pieces one day doing this, uh, this commercial for chicken pieces and thought, <laughs> do I want to tell my kids that this is what I do for a living? And mm -hmm. that really was what pushed him into, and then, and then me as his partner, into doing things that have more of a message and more of um, uh, an impact on people's lives other than to make them buy something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting business, and it's going to be a great festival. And I appreciate both of you coming on and talking with me today about it, and congratulations on all your good work you've been doing for the festival and then for you know the community and at large because it's a good thing it's a good way to promote what the corporate industry does in Minneapolis thanks a lot for being here thanks, thanks. Janet mm -hmm. we're gonna close out this segment with a very fun animated open for the video festival and let's roll it right now Well, we've enjoyed this show. I think we have some great guests on, and we're very excited about next month's show. The May Artifacts is going to be taped live at the Jungle Theater. 
down in South Minneapolis. So if you have any interest at all, and we urge you to think about it, come on down and be a member of the audience for the May Artifacts Show. You can call the City Cable 34 hotline 673-2234 to find out the details. And right now, I'd like you to get out a pen and a piece of paper so you can write down any of the great events we have coming up on our events calendar, including the Rivertown International Film Festival, which uh, opening night, I believe, is April 21st. And they have a great slate of films. It's really a wonderful event. I hope you can make some of those films. Uh, call the U Film Society if you want more information on that. Um, so coming up, the events calendar. And after that, Phil will be back with just a few words about Lois Holton, who passed away last month. Lois Holton died last month. She brought dance to thousands of us. In fact, our director tells me she was in a Lois Holton production as a child. I remember production staged at the Cedar Theater on the West Bank in Minneapolis. I lived with a dancer who took many classes from Lois and her company. Dancers do a lot of laundry. I remember a very angry Lois Holton right in the face of a policeman during the Red Barn Bust a quarter century ago. First I thought he was remarkably calm. Maybe he was just well trained. Or was he simply in awe of her passion? And, of course, there was the Nutcracker performance on every year at Northrop. For some reason, I always sat audience right, main floor. It's good to know an effort began last year to notate her choreography. Lois joined us on Artifacts in the fall of 1992. She and her husband brought a tape. And now we see a part of the Wingborn. This is a part of the I developed at the death of my first benefactress, Markel Brooks. And since I developed it, it took the dance world by storm and was called the Grand Pas de of the 20th century. And it's been performed in elegy for many, many people. And of late, it's being performed as an elegy for AIDS. Uh, dancers who have passed away. And for me, that's a beautiful thought. It was danced as an elegy for George Balanchine, one of the famous artists in America from Russia and for Walter Terry, a critic, and for Jean Dolly, local people, and it's been danced all over the world. In Mexico, they think I'm Indian. In Japan, they think I'm Oriental. And in Dance Theatre of Harlem, they think I'm Black. So what better reputation could you have that they can't quite tell when they see it? who I am 